and I launch into things, we should just hear from uh, our um, uh, acting president, interim president, um, Dr. Karen Walker-Freeberg. And uh, she's going to have just a word, please, Karen. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so blessed to have you here. There has been a new thing happening at Northern and just a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit from uh, some of you were here a week ago and for the first time, I've been here since 1983, uh, and a week ago we had our Founders Day homecoming event and it was standing room only. And I had never seen that kind of event and you know when you just see it's the Holy Spirit's work and this morning as we were worshiping I was thinking we've just trusted God and said, here we go, you, we will run for you, Lord, just show us which direction, where to go. We began the year with worship in here and invited students, and those students were here, you know, we started with like 45 chairs, and as we didn't know, our students are commuters mostly here at Northern Seminary, and, you know, we thought, okay, 45, maybe the students who are going to be here for the 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock classes will come, and over and over again, the staff had to keep going and putting more and more chairs. And that's the Holy Spirit's work. When people want to come worship, when we're hungry for him, when we just cannot wait to pour out the gift we've been given. And what a gift. Uh, Tasha Vincent Brown sort of gave birth to this with Michael Quick and the Lilly Foundation at funding us. And then Lauren Visser. We j you know, the shifts that have happened have been ones where we're looking and saying, God, what you just mean good for all of us in this. And so we thank you for being here. It was an early start. Whose idea was that? 7.30? <laughs> but here we are. The food is beautiful. The fellowship is beautiful. Um, just lean into the people who are around you. I know that we are going to l learn as much from one another today as we are from the, the intentional teaching that we've been preparing. And so may the Lord bless you. Take care of your churches and your families while you're here. May you just be still in your center and be present to this day and to one another. In Christ's name we pray that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Maybe you saw in the... Uh, in the press, it's a few weeks ago now that the Romanian Foreign Ministry had to make a major apology because their Paris embassy, embassy had had this big function and they'd invited people to come. And when they said they were coming, they uh, confirmed it by sending a spreadsheet which alongside each name had a comment about the kind of person they were. And uh, several names had the word unfavorable unsavory, and one actually had the word ghastly. <laughs> well, we have no idea quite whether that made a difference to whether they actually turned up or not, but there is unreserved welcome today. Alongside your names, there is, you know, loved by God and called by God and gifted by God, and uh, you're every single one of you welcome. And the great thrill for me is that we have here pastors, uh, preachers, we have uh, worship leaders, uh, of course, we have our students, a uh, vital part component of that. We have church leaders. We have a great variety, which is the intention, actually. And one of the surprises people are going to have is we call this a preaching forum, and you'll see there's a reason for that. But the idea is actually we're going to open the ways, believing this may be the Lord's new thing and that his power is going to be uh, at work with it. So we rejoice, we rejoice in our diversity. There are going to be lots of things happening today. And, and one of them will be that I'm going to encourage us to shift focus. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century is in danger of focusing on the wrong things in the wrong places, especially its preachers. Now, a sophisticated talk speaks of paradigm shifts when a worldview looking one way uh, comes with a number of factors to a uh, shift looking at something else. And it's far too pretentious to talk about what uh, I'm going to share as a, as a paradigm shift. But it is, I believe, revolutionary. I believe the implications of, of what I'm going to share as I dream would make a profound uh, difference. Uh, because shifting the focus is something which, as I go through these next few minutes together, lays the foundation. And uh, in this first session, I just want to encourage you with me to see, is this a shift of focus that, that 
you perceive as well is something we could be called to do. And then I want to move on in the, in the uh, second session to look at some of the implications for, for our actual preaching and leading and worship leading and all the rest. So I'm going to uh, be moving through uh, just a number of um, shifts, the first of which is, and I'm going to be trying to work this, and I have a tremendous gift, which you're seeing. And when I did press it in rehearsal, I went through six slides at once. I'm trying to do this, <laughs> shifting the focus. The first focus, could somebody just help me there to, there we go. You helped me, didn't you? I don't think it was this. Um, I shall keep looking to you. Uh, from sermon uh, making to sermon makers, or from uh, the act of preaching to the person of the preacher. And this is the great contrast which it seems to me is necessary because most preaching conferences I go to are focusing actually on becoming a, a better sermon maker. I've been to uh, conferences on exegeting better, listening to culture more effectively. I've been to a conference on prophetic preaching, on narrative preaching, uh, lots of things about designing how to be better. And if you go to a conference like that, you can walk away feeling fairly good because you can incorporate perhaps one or two ideas. And most preachers don't think they're that bad anyway. In fact, most preachers think they're well above average. Uh, and this is reality. This is an anecdote. There have been tests on it. Most of us as preachers think we're really pretty good. So the question is, does learning new technique make you a better preacher? Now, if all you're doing is looking on sermons, manufacturing sermons as the kind of end products, if that's all that you're looking at, then, of course, you can talk about producing something which people can rate and, and grade. And um, this kind of, this is how people in the, in the pew view it, people in the church, that the preacher does something, they're not quite sure what it is sometimes. Um, I, I was at a, 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 a big weekend in the southwest of England. I had a rally of many churches on a Saturday night, and then I was preaching in a, a church on a Sunday. They both gave me texts and themes. And to my horror, I was very busy at this time, um, I hadn't got anything in my bag to help me with either of them. Normally, you've got some, something you can use and, and, and adjust, the Lord being my helper. Anyway, I got nothing. And I, 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 said, I said to the organizer, how long do you think it takes if you give a preacher a text and theme to create a sermon? This is somebody I knew well, a leading lay person. And he said, well, I would guess two or three hours. But he said, if you're experienced, it'd be much quicker than that. And so people see us preachers, those of us who are preachers, that we do something and then we start it and uh, it goes on and sometimes on and on. You'll know that the biggest complaint about our preaching is it goes on too long. Uh, and that's quite serious. Anyway, it goes on and on, then it finishes. And at the end of it, you can say, oh, that was good, that helped me, or, or it wasn't, or he was better than last week. We can make our assessments. Of course you can, because the sermons become a kind of commodity. You do it and you produce it. And this is disastrous. This shift to make sermons sort of commodities that we do. And there are lots of reasons why that is. And the first reason, as we say no to sermons as end products, is because of put sermons in boxes. Uh, by this I mean you do your thing as a preacher, you come to that moment in, in public worship, and you open a box, and everybody looks in the box, and then you close it and you go about your thing. And, and the second reason associated with that, really, is that you become, if you're not careful, it becomes a communication exercise. And some people are better at communication than others. I don't know if you've noticed that. But some people are much more skillful at speaking, and uh, interestingly, than others. And so what happens is, you know, he's better, no, she's better, I prefer that. And so it becomes a question sometimes, because sermons are seen as the be-all and end-all, he's better. The third thing that happens when we look at this is that it puts preachers in lonely places. For the few, it puts them on pedestals because they're acknowledged as great preachers. Sometimes they know it too. 
And uh, as a great preacher, you're in that place and people come and you have the excitement of people coming to hear you as a preacher. But more often, and this is, this is the reality that Lily has been finding out in this program, people are put in places where they are in fact very lonely and they're behind closed doors, they're working in a place where having worked very hard on something, they then step out into the public view. Somebody described it, their experience as being a hybrid of a beauty contest, a piano recital, and a competitive sporting event. And if you can't play the piano very well, and if you've broken your leg, which, for example, I did a year ago, then, then you are in trouble because you go in front of people. And for some, some people, preaching actually underneath is discouraging. But the most serious reason of all is that what it does is to elevate pride of performance. And uh, it gives preachers a sense of status and significance. And they become, if you're not careful, prima donnas strutting the stage because they know they can do their stuff. And it displaces the need for humble dependency. And for the things which obviously for us uh, are speaking, as we did earlier today, of, of trusting in God and depending on him. Of course, we say that stuff. But by and large, when preaching is a commodity you're good at producing, then you go forward and with a great deal of pride, if you can do it, it increases, I fear, pride. These are the four things which, as you look at it, actually sum up the grave danger of looking at sermon making, of sermons in boxes and reducing them to end products. And I want to shift that focus because we have to say to this a very loud no. A couple of times I'm going to say no, but a very loud no. Because when God calls preachers and others into these, he calls persons. He calls persons. He calls them ambassadors because it's as though he's going to speak through them. He calls them as witnesses because they've been touched by the transforming grace of, of Christ. They've, they've become themselves evidences that God is real and God can change lives. And as witnesses and as, as ambassadors, it's not to do with skills and techniques. It's not what you do. Of course it's not. It's primarily who you are. If you're a witness, you're somebody who's known firsthand what it means to belong in God's grace and his story. And, and it shows. And that's what matters first and foremost about the way in which the Lord calls us. And so the shift from preparing sermons and getting that better to preparing preachers and getting them better is what I believe the Lord is calling us uh, to do. And unless we do this, the tendency obviously is that uh, we dwell on the uh, communication skills and if you're good at it and you've got good rhetoric uh, and you, you, you can really build uh, a congregation, then of course people regard that often as good preaching. But too often it's a bit like Matthew 6 2 where Jesus talks about religious people who do things in public. They have their reward already. They get a lot of applause, but I've not been in it. And it's not been happening in their fellowship as I really wanted it to. Preaching has become this up the front exercise. Now, don't misunderstand me. Every single one of us can be better at doing it. And uh, in no way do, do we want to neglect the skills and the techniques. And those who are students here there's no way one can jump over the homiletics courses here, which deserve the very best of attention and, 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 and commitment. But the truth is, unless we understand that as ambassadors and as witnesses, God has called us as people to live for him and to live in our community for him, unless that happens, uh, then we are clearly going to be, I believe, stale and having our reward already rather than living in God's new thing. So don't let's judge preaching by how good any particular sermon is. It's about witnesses proclaiming that God is building a new people who will live differently compared with the culture around because preachers in the midst are living with them and living out what it means to belong to God. 
and his big purpose being alive. A preacher called Kay Northcutt um, was uh, successful and had been preaching effectively for 10 years, was nearing burnout. And uh, she wrote a book called Kindling Desire for God. Because nearing burnout, she, she realized how she just needed to get away. And so she took a laptop full of church stuff and she went on retreat. And the first day she was on retreat, she met a spiritual director. She'd never had a spiritual director before. And the spiritual director said, why have you come all this way in order to avoid God? Put that laptop away, you're not to open it. And for this next week, you're to learn what it is to be with God and to be attentive to God. And so for Kay Northcott, it became this experience of, she said, becoming like a nine-year-old child again. <laughs> and she'd, she'd never been attentive to who God is, and she began to listen to some of the great spiritual greats and in to get, in to interact with people. And as she did this, she found herself really transformed. She, she said it was like the tension, and we've, we've encountered this before, she does it very graphically, uh, between being drawn to God, we already had that one, drawn to God or driven by busyness. And she recognized, I mean, we, we've heard this before, right? But she realized that the being drawn to God is actually about being attracted by his grace. And in the very attraction of God, we find ourselves caught up in a dynamic that actually attracts others too. Business, just as organizational. Uh, and so she moved on to proclaim the kind of person that she believes she ought to be. And um, one of the doyens of, of preaching, uh, Fred Craddock, who some of you I know will have encountered and read, he comments that recent studies in homiletics over the last 20 years, of course he's been responsible for some of them, have rarely looked at the preacher's character, life, and faith. It's, it's been technique. It's been getting it better. And it's time, therefore, and he uh, endorses what uh, the um, uh, definition that Kay Northcutt gives. Uh, with all definitions, they're partial. But just think about this, about who it, what it means to be a preacher. The preacher is one who is God's person. One who knows God, who practices the presence of God, and hence is able to guide the community into doing likewise. We move from the entirely cognitive, which sometimes preaching can be, to the intuitive, recognizing that God is drawing and guiding and leading and moving us. And this is why this program, which we're going to talk about and extol and encourage you to pray about and think about and, and noise, celebrate about, we're calling it a new kind of preacher. It's not about a new kind of preaching. That's, that's fairly common. There are lots of people to tell you how you can actually improve your preaching. But the Lord is calling us to be ambassadors, witnesses, new kinds of preacher. The second uh, shift of focus is from focusing on the church and how it works to God and how he works. Those of us involved in church leadership and ministry know that there are three building blocks uh, which we have to bring together. Uh, one, two, three. And it doesn't take much thought to realize that those uh, building blocks are God, church, world. And uh, that's the kind of stuff of every day of what we're about. Linking God, church, and world. Now, the question is, which takes priority? Of course, it's a no-brainer. Uh, God takes priority. He's the beginning and the ending of all things. He's the creator of the cosmos. And uh, in his big vision, there's nothing left over. There's nothing left out. <laughs> this, this is God's big story. And when he creates, and it's so good, and then it goes so wrong in the fall, we see the story of the covenant with a new people and the promise that there might be one and there might be springs in the desert and there might be something new, even the animals will rejoice. We wonder what that can be and then Christ comes 
Jesus the King who fulfills all the yearnings. And, and as he moves through, through his dying and his rising, there is this kingdom to belong to. And we find ourselves living in this, this story, which is God's. And I, I can only really understand my life, I think you can only understand your life, in terms of living within the way in which God has placed us within his world, which is on its way towards fulfillment and consummation in a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, there is a mighty thing that God is doing, and we're within that story. And it's, it's his story. So we find ourselves challenged whenever we think, this is, this is Christian faith 101, that, that God's the beginning and God's the ending and, and he is everything in everything. And so quite clearly, when we're talking about the ways in which the building blocks, uh, we, uh, we find ourselves putting God first. And what's the main thing about putting God first? Well, lots of things. But I, I want to emphasize that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, you can get it wrong because God is unknowable and unpredictable in the ways in which by his spirit he can breathe and transform and do things beyond our imagining. When he reveals who he is in Jesus, you suddenly find extraordinary, radical possibilities of a way in which we can live together. And so when you talk about the ways in which God is calling us and working for us, there is at the heart of it this mystery with a capital M. There is, there's a wonderful sense that, that God always, as somebody who are noble in his attributes of holiness and wisdom and, and might and love, has shown us himself in Jesus. And, and Jesus is still doing that with us and, and for us. Don't uh, unscrew the inscrutable was a graffiti uh, written up. Don't unscrew the inscrutable. This is just fantastic stuff, how God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So, of course, in terms of constructing how it works, we put God first. But we don't. Because what happens is, and this is bizarre, isn't it? We st spend nearly all our time to focusing on the church. Because the church, uh, making it work, uh, fulfilling its uh, responsibilities, the worship services, the structures, the wider implications, the denominations perhaps we belong to, all, all this stuff becomes so important that church begins to, to constrain. And uh, we, of course, pray to God, and we sing, and we preach about God. But essentially, you're coming to God through the church. And uh, you have, uh, uh, there's um, uh, John Kersler has written in a recent book about objectifying God, that God almost becomes a church product. You want to know about God, then come to our church, and we'll show you. You worship with us, and you do our stuff, and you follow our programs, and you're no God. And just as it's so dangerous commodifying sermons and making those things in themselves, it's desperately dangerous taking God and thinking that we can somehow put him in a place and by doing our church work, begin to understand exactly how he works in his world with his people. Uh, John Kersner talks about airbrushed Christianity. And in his book, he talks about the person who went to his large mega church and uh, was asked about it and was trying to be sort of uh, positive and said, well, they seem just a little too happy there. Because what happens when a real people of God grow, as God calls them to be, is not just a church thing. So we find ourselves really facing a, a, a need for shifting the focus from church centricism and so if we shift the focus, uh, we find ourselves focused on the church. And these are the dangers. And a bit like with making preaching as a commodity. Th these are real dangers. And we find ourselves, next slide please, Hannah, as we go through, assuming that God's knowable and predictable. Because human agency and competence become all important. Because actually nothing is happening 
for God's name, but we can't explain in terms of church work. I mean, not even people are coming to faith and baptism, but the sociologists wouldn't say, well, those are your own young people. They, you, you've nurtured them. They're joining the club. They're joining the clan. There's nothing just extraordinary speaking of God at work. And uh, as with preachers, encouraging pride of performance and being prima donnas, you get prima donna churches too, who think they've got it right and can almost sort of predict what God's going to do. Uh, and uh, I've known what it's been to serve in churches like this and to be extremely uncomfortable in the church I was in, in Cambridge when a, a group came and asked whether we could start services of healing and they said, we, we believe in James and that uh, when people are sick and they come and ask, there should be an anointing with oil. Um, it very nearly divided the church. Uh, and the, the basic thing was that some people believe the Holy Spirit could do this. And the other people are long since given up on any idea that the Holy Spirit could do anything. And the great joy was that things happened. And we learned and we grew and we were humbled. And it misses out this unpredictable, glorious love that we find working out as we discern. It misses out the Isaiah 43 challenge. It, 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 it gives a kind of predictability that we sense, well, we can work out what God's doing. So needy prayer goes right out the window. You don't really need to pray because already we've sort of mapped out what God's going to do. Uh, and the expectation that God will act in our midst is far removed. And I think very seriously, it pushes the world into the third place. It actually treats God as 90%, if not 99%, involved with the church. And if he's going to be involved with the world at all, it's what we do for him. And so our projects, our giving, all that we do become, in a sense, God's arm in the world. And God really needs us uh, because we are, are obviously the people. Well, we are the people. But if we forget that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, that God is at work in the world, we forget that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and uh, is alive and at work all the time, right with us in church, but right outside there with the people around us and that we are joining in with his work if we only discern it. If we begin to capture something of that, then we can no longer focus just on the church. We are drawn back to God. Now, as we go, it's extraordinary weather, isn't it? I'm looking out, I've lost all visibility. You know, normally when you're a bit bored as a speaker, and you can get bored as a speaker, never mind listening, you know, you can look out over this lake. Isn't it amazing? Anyway, you can just hear me, I hope. Um, the, the reality is that when we talk about you kinds of preachers, we're talking about persons. And we're talking about persons who really want to know more about who God is. And so we major on the Trinity. We major on the Father, Son, and Spirit, and understanding the difference that makes, the profound difference that makes to the ways in which we behave and we long. And so we push towards this whole business about working and understanding God as active and present. And uh, that mission, and this is such a, a great thing today, missional theology, of course, we call it. It's recapturing what the church knew in the first place. They didn't talk about evangelism. Uh, you won't see that. Because they knew that God was at work with them. And wherever they went, he was there. And whatever hostile place, he was there. We sang that, uh, it was a new one to me, about the victory. Uh, that he gives us, and we have no, I forget the line now, but there's no one against us. There, there's a sense in which God opens the doors, and he says, step out with me, because I, Father, Son, and Spirit, is a mystery, it's wonderful, but I'm actually energizing something, because I love this world, and there isn't anything that happens in this world that I don't love, and I don't notice, and I don't care about. So the people who live on your road, and the people who live next door to where you worship, and the people who actually, within your community, you have given up on. You don't spend any, any time on. You need to know that I love them just as much as I love you. No, it can't be. Uh, I do. And I'm calling you to refocus and understand just who I am as your great God, Father, Son, and Spirit.
whose mission is alive and well, if you only see it and join in with it. The, the church that I, I go to now has a, a, a lovely uh, pastor, and he's one of my former students, and so he's been really uh, effectively trained. Uh, and uh, and it, it is very gracious because you know, he's got to put up with me sitting there. And, uh, so, and he's really, really good. But he also, he wants feedback, which is sometimes difficult to give. Um, it really is to give honest feedback. Because you know what it's like if you're a preacher listening to other preachers? Sometimes difficult. Let me just leave it like that. He did a series, The Church That Jesus Christ Imagined. And a series of ten, and he works extraordinarily hard. And he gave the background to Jesus with the pictures of the temple and the body, uh, and uh, the holy people and the family. And he gave this, uh, the, the, the background to it, and he spoke about it, and he informed us about the church that Jesus imagined. And he had PowerPoints, and all the time we saw this church that Jesus Christ imagined. And he kept saying, I want feedback. I want feedback from you. And of course, a lot of people were saying, great job. Great job, Pastor. Um, and I, I mean, he did work hard, and there was a lot of meat there. And I didn't know what to say, but when I did see him, and I don't know, I, I suppose this, he might see this video. I just love you, Ron. But do, do you remember I said to you, could, could the series not have been called The Church That Jesus Christ Imagines? Imagines. Because isn't he building, present tense? Isn't it something we're seeing and working into? And it was quite a surprise to him. And he blinked twice and thanked me and moved on. <laughs> but we do, we look past tense. Because when we're talking church, we thank God for what he's done for us. He's delivered us. He's made us a new people. He's, Jesus has died for us. And we give thanks for that. And then we plow along without realizing that that's actually what I did then. And as interceding Lord, ascended, risen Lord, it's what I'm still doing with you now. I want to build with you now. So we need to shift the focus from the way in which church centricism so often uh, makes us look back and become, if, you, if you're not very careful, people who lock God into our programs and our thoughts and miss the wonders of belonging for him. I want now to shift to the next thing, the shift three, uh, which is from jostling different priorities to focusing on one which embraces everything. You're going to have a list of things, long list of things that you do. Uh, and uh, you will find those of us who are pastors and preachers, and those of us in ministry in different ways, and those of us who are students who've got experience of church life, you can make a long list of things that you think you have to do. And I'm going to ask you just to pause. I, I've got to give you a break um, for a moment. Um, I must do that. Uh, I want you to pause and think, of all those things, what, what's the most important thing? What, and what's the goal of that thing? Some of you are going to say preaching. And, you know, is it evangelism? Is it pastoral encouragement? Is it uh, social justice? Uh, you know, what would you say is, for you, the most important thing which in the very busy lives, and some of you, of course, are plunged into it, you're preaching tomorrow, you've got all this stuff you're doing tomorrow, and you're wondering, some of you, why am I here today? Because there's so much. Of all those things, what's the most important? So let me just ask you, and I'm going to give you just a few moments. If you've not yet properly met people around your table, just sort of introduce uh, properly. But just reflect, what's the one thing? And I'm just going to ask you in, in a few moments, and it won't be long, to shout out, uh, in a word or two, what it is that kind of motivates you. So can we just do that? In your ministry, what's the most important thing? In your, in your church, in the way in which you think about ministry, the most important thing, go. Uh, friends, if we could uh, just draw, um, and this is very creative, we've got a table uh, talk and, and questions as you'll see. Because for us, learning from each other is, is so vital. I'm going to explain more about that as we go through. Can we just have a very quick, I hope you can just uh, shout out, I'd love to hear, as you think about 
summing up, I know it's difficult, what are the words that you sum up the, the sort of primary goal of, of your work, the most important thing? Listening? Love, love. Sorry? Glorify God. Discipleship. There'll be others, I'm sure, who say that's, that's a great catch-all as well. Anything else? Because, um, I mean, I know there are lots of things, but, sorry? Community. Community. Um, I want to give you one word, and I'm, I've, my clicker apparently was the battery. I'm very relieved, because normally when things go wrong, it's entirely my fault. <laughs> entirely, and it looks as though it may not be. Um, uh, but as we move on, um, I want to try and emphasize what is actually at my heart, and some of you know this, which is why at least one of these replies came, um, I mean, I believe in it passionately, but I believe the one word, if you want to sum up what we're about, the most important thing is the word worship. And that's because worship is something which often that will surprise people, has itself been put in a box. I, I was at a conference um, last week, and uh, sitting next to a pastor, and he turned to me and said that he'd been at a worship service. I don't think he'd been preaching, but he said he'd, he'd heard the sermon, and then the worship leader said, let's get back to really worshipping God. Let's get back to really worshipping God. Uh, as though the only thing that really matters is... Have we got a leak? Oh dear. <laughs> Um, the only thing that really matters is the sense in which, as we come before our, our Lord God, we get the music right. And so worship leaders often are musicians. And we find ourselves with this truncated view, view of ever liturgists. And of course, very different from the preacher, because we've got our own separate box. And I want to make a plea, and I'm going to develop this in the, in the next session, that the one undergirding, primary, motivating force in our lives, the one thing that matters above all else is our worship of God and how we are worshipping and how it invades every thought and every moment of every day. And clearly, when we understand how God works, that is the Alpha and Omega, that his creator, that he gives us that, that wonderful song, you know, with the breath in our lungs, we worship you. You give us the breath in our lungs. That sense that we owe so much then blows wide open any narrow concept of worship. And we find ourselves committed to something really big as we come, in whatever form of Christian leadership we take, because it's all about worshipping and responding to Jesus Christ. Worship, and one of my favourite definitions uh, is the one, Thomas Truer, that all of us for all of God. It's uh, really based strongly on Romans 12, 1 to 2. Uh, you offer yourselves li bo living bodies, li bodies, living sacrifices. By the way, if it's a body, it can't be a bit of you. It, it's all of you. And your transformed, your renewed mind means that you're no longer conformed to this world. It's a totally holistic, wow, get it right. It's all of me for all of God. And as soon as we begin to see that this, we have this extraordinary sense that there's no point of our lives ever where we step outside God's grace and God's call upon us that we worship. We worship every day. The uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, of course, asks, what is the chief purpose of man? And some of you will know this very well. The end purpose, the chief man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that is our chief end. And we sadly sometimes have shifted the focus and we let other things come in the way which are bound up. Everything you mentioned is caught up, love and community. Uh, they're, they're caught up, I believe, in one key aim of, of worship. So when we gather as a, worship, as a, a congregation uh, to worship, it is a bit like a a shop window where it's easier to sing with people 
than on your own. At least some of us find it much easier. Uh, it's more bearable in my case. Uh, and uh, when you come with other people, it's wonderful to be lifted into a sense of community which is being built. But the, the purpose of coming and glorifying God and confessing and interceding and offering yourself is that when you leave the church, you worship in all that you do and are. And it's that scattering. You gather to scatter, which is the profound transforming rhythm and a focus I want to make. But instead of ourselves having many different things, we realize there's a unifying issue that we come to worship. I was speaking at uh, Trinity uh, Evangelical Divinity School um, on this theme, and it was one of these academic things, and I had a paper, and then I got two people to, two people were responding to it, uh, to academics. And one of them uh, teaches uh, worship and spirituality. And he said to me, because this thing, all of us fall of God, he said, it, it's, it's, it's right, um, but it's very, it's very complex. I couldn't see how I could teach something like that. You know, somehow you've got to, it's just too big. And, um, you know, how do you, when you've finished your gathered worship, you go and have a cup of coffee, how do you drink your coffee worshipfully? And he didn't say that, but I mean, that's the kind of question he was posing. Well, I can tell you this, you can drink coffee unworshipfully. Because you can forget in this moment that you are actually God's child. You've just been worshipping with God's children. They're brothers and sisters. You belong with them. And if you're not open to the sense that you belong with them as you drink your coffee, you're really missing out on the reality that all of us, for all of God, means even drinking coffee. Certainly being here is worship. Um, so we find ourselves challenged to focus on worship. And this is something which then leads on uh, to this uh, profoundly um, practical issue. Some of these are quite big. Uh, the, the fourth uh, shift from working as individuals in isolation to working as collaborators in community. Uh, one of the things that the Lilia Foundation talk with us at length, was that their studies across America kept discovering that preachers were, their language was lone rangers. And we understand about that, and it's a very old movie now. I saw it when I was young, um, but it's very old. Though he did have Tonto, uh, so there was at least one other person. But the lone ranger, of course, sorry? And the horse. Let's not forget the horse. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, John. Uh, <laughs> It's owls, jackals, and horse. Um, one of the great things uh, about learning about our prime role to encourage in our own worship of all of us, and all of God, others to gather and to scatter, is that you cannot possibly remain a lone ranger. And that's why it's marvelous to have a range of folk which we hope to go on developing as the story goes out. Because there needs to be a real sense in which we confront head-on individualism in the church. Individualism severely damages the kingdom. It's, an, it's the nature of culture that we tend to think of me and mine and, and my, and certainly the way in which so often we choose our own preferences and we do things to please ourselves is so embedded, the thought of actually taking responsibility for another person who is not immediate family, or not likable. It is anathema to us. Carol and I were outside a big store in, in uh, England just last month, and we saw this sign, and it was a big department store, and it said, uh, more choice, more style, more you. And as always happens, uh, you like this sign, I jot it down. I said, that's, it was huge. I thought, that's the spirit of this age. I want more choice, and I, I want more style, my style, and it's going to be more me. I want more me. And that's how people come into church increasingly. And we know about the consumers in our midst uh, who uh, actually are consciously making choices of preferences without any conception that they belong with brothers and sisters sitting next to them. And they're sitting there in church, 
and they're singing and they're praying and they're talking about others, but in terms of belonging and community and growing together, it doesn't even begin to happen. And the implications for a preacher are just vast. Uh, how we operate with others. And I'm going to be teasing this out uh, in the next session, but uh, how do we collaborate? The truth is that some of us in some cultures find that very difficult. I know when I, uh, my African-American students say very often we, whether we want to be or not, we're a bit on a pedestal. Uh, and it's, it's rather difficult to open it up to others. But there are one or two of you here, I hope we're going to hear from, from somebody on the panel you know, who, who's, who's, who's doing this and, and can help us to see, even within a culture where the, the preacher is the thing, that actually when you begin to learn about this, you can grow uh, in collaboration. Um, it's how we behave with others. And there are lots of practical issues there about making sure we join what I call the dots of, of the kingdom vision. <laughs> we make sure that that when the preacher does their thing, it's part of the very big picture and uh, that God is blessing it all together. And so we find ourselves obviously challenged about how we help people to be community and we break through the individualism, but the great challenge is for preachers and worship leaders, we have some here, that there's a sense in which working in isolation undoes the very nature of God's kingdom. And so we find ourselves with these four changes of focus. They are shifts. They have implications, which I'm going to work on. There are, I'm sure, other things we could add. And one of the joys of this creative process is that, that I've, I mean, I've never done this before. This is entirely new. Sometimes when a conference speaker does things, you know, they've been done before and they're reheated. Th this is just a mess. It's just chaos in terms of, is this right? Could this be so? Where do we uh, focus more? But the joy and wonder of it is it's given in the spirit of Isaiah 43 um, about God doing a new thing. Are we seeing it? Can he work with us? Can he do things? And uh, we know that when he does, he promises new creation. So this is why new kinds of preaching is our concern today. And this is why, as we gather, we're a mixed bunch. And this is why we're not immediately talking about how to do better preaching and sermons, which some people would love, because it's great if you can give some ideas, give us a story, give us, you know. Um, but we're here to see what God's doing if we dare to shift the focus. We have two minutes or three minutes before we break is there anything that, as I've said, you, as I've spoken, you really want to pick up, you didn't understand, you didn't agree with, uh, anything immediately you want to say? Because we want to make sure your voices are heard, they will be a bit later on. But is there anything, as we now have this accompaniment, it's quite rhythmic, isn't it? Um, th this, this building, we're discovering things today, I think. Um, so, Dan. Oh, did it go too quickly? Right. It's from focusing. Who got it? From focusing on the church and how it works to focusing on God and how he works. Uh, from the church and how it works. And it's this sense, as you will realize, that there's so much organization that dominates that we tend to see God through the organization. Yeah? Nate. Yeah. 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 I want to begin with those um, next next time. Or no, what do I want to do? No, I want to begin with the four shifts next time rather than those. But these are issues which, if you like, undergird. And if I was to be asked after experience of um, I, I began, I was ordained um, a long time ago, and I, I've lost count of the conferences I've been to. But I would say th this is the biggest shift methodologically for a group of, of preachers and leaders and worship leaders uh, 
because so often they're in boxes and they are commodities and they do make us proud. I, I mean, when people say, good job, pastor, it, it, it does things to you. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the all of us for all of God is a very shorthand. Um, that's a definition which speaks of the totality. I go back to uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2, and I invite people to take seriously what it means to be, uh, to make our response as living sacrifices, offering our bodies as spiritually acceptable, holy, pleasing, our minds transformed. I like, so I like the tag, all of us for all of God. That's part two. And then speak about offering our bodies. And then obviously we come together, we gather, we must gather, because that's where we're sustained. And that's where we can praise God and adore him. And most importantly, that's where we, we become God's uh, new people. We behave differently when we're in Christian community. And there's a lot of wonderful literature now about the new language we learn. Because we use words like sin. The world doesn't, if it uses it, it doesn't use it properly. And redemption, salvation, wholeness, the treasured words that people need to learn about. And of course, in community, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper become central. One of my beefs is uh, sometimes that the Lord's Supper, which is the one thing Jesus asked us to do, keep doing. I mean, baptism, yes, that's initiation and that's to be treasured. And sometimes we don't do that well, frankly. But communion, he says, you know, will you meet with me? And it's so simple, you can do it anywhere. It's bread and, 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 and fruit juice or whatever. Um, it's so simple. But when you do that and you just follow it, I'm there. And you belong together in a way, in fact, one or two writers, Don Salyer says, you're never more human than when you're gathered around the table. You're never more human. Now, that really takes some believing, because for most people it's tacked on the end, and, and, and you hope the sermon's not gone too long, and very often there's very little sense that you're actually looking around and looking ahead. It's, we thank you, Lord, for what you did for us. This is your sacrifice, and we thank you. Uh, Jesus saying, yeah, I did that, but that was for a purpose. And that purpose is that person sitting next to you that you've not spoken to ever because you were offended by them. And actually, this is meaningless, this sharing and breaking bread, unless you look to them. And that's why it's such a very special way of, of moving. So I think, I mean, there's so many great definitions of, of worship, but um, it's quite provocative, all of us, for all of God. So we can go, this is all worship we're about, our conversations, it, 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 it's the way we relate, it's the way we see things, uh, it's wonderful. I'm going to go on to that in a minute. So we need now to take a break. We've come to the moment to have a, another break. It's for how long, Lauren? Ten minutes. So time again for a, a refill or whatever. 10 minutes, and then I just follow up, and then that will be the end of, of uh, this uh, English voice. The clicker may be renewed. Let's pray for a renewed clicker. Um, so enjoy, just please, 10 minutes.